All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to that uh, week podcast. Um, the subject this week will be um, medial tibial um, stress syndrome. So I hope you guys are doing well. I hope everybody's um, excited for that topic today. Uh, maybe you probably don't know what is medial tibial stress syndrome. You probably know it as another name, for example, shin splint. But we'll talk about it and we'll see... Um, We'll see why uh, we use the term medial tibial stress syndrome. But before starting, I need to say hello to Gian, her physiotherapist. So hello. how's it going, Gian? I am doing well, thanks. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good too. That's a That's really good. nice week we're having right now. Actually, there's some rain, okay. but it's always good to have a little bit, a little bit of rain here in. Uh, Lots in, of wind. Oh, the wind! Oh. Do without the wind. The wind cannot stop here. It's That's a crazy right. thing. Um, mm -hmm. For people who are not from Wainwright or Alberta, um, yeah, if you if you don't like wind, well, this is not the place for you. <laughs> here, it uh, never stops. But yeah, so um, today, just before we start, you said to me, Gian, that uh, it's getting really busy at uh, the clinic right now. More so, yeah. Yeah, there's some surgeries um, that have been opened up now. So, yeah, we're seeing a few more people for sure. Good. Yep. We don't, uh, as PSP, we um, for the gym itself, uh, we don't have a confirmation when it's going to start yet. Um, even today, uh, our job, uh, my boss, actually, Jordan, he, he was really working hard to try to open the gym um, as soon as possible. So we'll... You guys will know for sure when we're going to open the gym. Like, we're not going to just uh, give you a 24 hours notice. It's going to be probably a week notice. So you'll know a um, long time before uh, when we're going to open the gym. I know that uh, some military are getting really excited about that. They just want the gym open as soon as possible. I'll be honest, even me, I love my house. I love my place here, but I kind of miss the gym. Um, so I can't wait for that to be open. Um, but yeah, we're getting there. I think we're uh, closer to a reopen than uh, keeping it closed. So we're like more than halfway done of uh, quarantine for sure. Um, so let's keep positive thinking and uh, let's hope that we're going to open that gym soon. Um, yeah, so let's see. I just want to know if we have, yeah, we have enough attendees um, that are online right now. So yeah, feel free to... Uh, send any message uh, on the chat and um, we will uh, answer your question. If you do have any questions, don't worry about it. Even if you ask the question and we're not really, we're kind of like ignoring your question. We are not. We just want to finish what we want to say first and then we'll get to your question right after. Um, also this week, we do have a lot of um, uh, visuals, information. Uh, we have a lot of stuff for you. So I will try. Last week, what I did is the handouts and all the links and stuff like that. I sent it at the end of the podcast. Um, I'll try to do it like as we go. Uh, when we show, uh, for example, a video, I'll try to send it in the, in the chat so you can guys uh, download it and then see it on your phone right after. I uh, would recommend that you don't look at it while we're explaining it. I'll show you. Like you, we will use my uh, computer screen to go see exactly the videos. And we will obviously, all the videos are muted. Uh, we will talk over uh, the videos. So uh, don't worry about it. Like you can just sit tight on your, uh, on your couch, watch out on your phone or on your laptop and just let it go. Ask your questions. And at the end of, uh, or during the podcast, I'll send you all the handouts for sure. So you can like use the visual or uh, as a reference for the future. And also this week, we do have a prescription um, that it will be sent to you guys that you can follow uh, if you do have uh, this kind of injury. Uh, you will be able to um, to go ahead and, and do it uh, during this time um, of year, even if you don't have access to a gym. It's doable without a gym for sure. Um, all right, so are we ready to get started? You ready, Dan? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just looking if I'm missing some stuff. No, all right. So uh, today's topic. Oh, I just lost Gian. Uh, she's gonna get back. 
Um, but today's topic is going to be the medial tibial stress syndrome. So this is commonly known as a shin splints, as, as we already mentioned. Um, this is the most common source of exercise include uh, induced lower leg pain in runners and also in military personnel. Most of the time military personnel, it's because the, uh, when they do their basic training, um, they have a, a really big increase of physical activity of what they're used to do before joining the military. So they will commonly uh, end up with uh, a shin splint or a medial tibial stress syndrome. So uh, just to prevent us to say all the time medial tibial stress syndrome, we're going to use the acronym. So it's going to be MTSS. Uh, if we, if you hear us saying MTSS, that's that's pretty much what we're saying right now. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a common injury in the military, and uh, according to some studies, uh, the the numbers are pretty high. Um, they show the incidence of the of MTSS uh, is as high as thirty five percent of military personnel and athletes. Um, so let's share a screen so I can uh, make you guys. Oh, okay. I'm uh, learning some stuff on my share screen. That's fun. Okay, let's move this. Do you guys, can you guys see my screen right now? Okay, now you guys can see my screen for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, some studies, we do have all these studies right here. I think it's this one here. This one here. So this is a, a study that shows that um, the incidence uh, uh, is at 35% for uh, the military. Um, this is obviously a naval, so a naval recruit, so that's American. But obviously, it's it's going to reflect um, the Canadian military for sure um, during um, during the basic training. So as I mentioned, um, the military really get this common injury because uh, during the basic training phase, and they will also create that. You can also see it in runners. Uh, people who run a lot, they will also create that kind of injury. Um, and it's a ratio. There's a ratio here of women are more likely to have shin splint than men. Uh, it's like 53% over 28%. And historically, I uh, know not this yet. Yeah, so this is pretty much, oh, it's written right here. Uh, so it's um, it's pretty much women uh, that can most likely will develop uh, MTSS uh, over men's um, during their recruit training. So this study, you guys can uh, can really read it if you want uh, later on, but I kind of like that study. It's a really good one. Um, <clears throat> historically, MTSS has been described as an inflammatory reaction to chronic loads uh, of a deep, soft tissue that connects the lower leg muscles to the shin bone. The pain is typically localized in the inner aspect of the lower leg. And other studies are suge suggesting, sorry, that's a hard word for a French guy, <laughs> that MTSS may be associated with lower regional bone mineral density and related to tibial bending during the chronic weight bearing activity so these are these are the studies that i'm talking about um the these studies are going to be also they're pretty uh nice to read so uh they're going to be for you to read later on now before we start and i forgot to open these pictures but before we start we need to learn sorry about that we need to learn the anatomy. That's what I like to do every week. We need to know like what is the region that we're talking about. So let's do a little bit of anatomy. So bear with me. I'm just going to open the pictures of our podcast. We do have some anatomy pictures. There you go. So as you can see on the picture, we have two long bone right here in the lower leg, the fibula and the tibia. I can uh, zoom in a little bit. There you go. So that's what you can see. They are surrounded by 13 muscles that have a role um, on the ankle and the foot mobility and stability. 
muscles are divided in four compartments. So you can read all the muscles here, but we're not gonna like name it all. I'm just gonna focus on that picture that I've uh, kind of had fun um, modifying. There is four compartments of, uh, of these muscles. So this is like if you cut the leg in half on a disc and that's what you see. You can see the tibia bone right here and you can see the fibula bone here. So uh, the first one is the anterior compartment, which is in the front of the leg of the lower leg. If you pull your toes upward, your kneecap will see and feel the muscles of the anterior compartment contract. The, these four muscles are responsible for dorsiflexion of the ankle and also invert and evert of the foot. Invert, evert. Gian will show you that right after. The second compartment um, has a lateral compartment, which is on the outside of the lower leg and contains the uh, perineus longus and the perineus uh, brevis. Did I say that right, Gian, in English or? Yeah. <laughs> in French, it's pemini. We, uh, it's pretty much almost the same. Uh, they are responsible of, uh, for plantar flexion and of the ankle and the aversion of the foot. The third one is the superficial poster posterior compartment, which contains the large calf muscle. These muscles are responsible for plantar flexion of the ankle and knee bending. The fourth and last compartment is the deep posterior compartment and is underneath the large calf muscle. Uh, the muscle contains muscles contains wooden plantar flexion, the ankle uh, of the ankle and invert of the foot. Now, Gian, I say a lot of like weird word like plantar dorsiflexion, inversion, all that. Uh, do you have a visual for us to help us better understand what it is? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, uh, Gian. Maybe you need to unmute. There you go. You hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Okay. So here is a leg and a foot. So plantar flexion is uh, basically when the toes go down relative to the uh, knee. So when we run, we plantar flex a lot to push off. When we go up on our toes, that's a plantar flex position. So anything where the toes are moving down away from the front part of the knee. So dorsiflexion, we often think of that as bringing the toe up toward the knee, and that is correct. However, functionally, we more likely would bring the knee toward the foot like so. So when we go into a squat position, when we descend stairs, we have to dorsiflex. So anytime the knee and the toes are coming closer together, that's a dorsiflex position. This particular model doesn't really do in an eversion, so I'm going to switch to this one. This is a left foot, as you can see here. So inversion is when the arch of the foot lifts up, and we move into an inward position. So kind of like, this is confusing because this is backwards like that and then when we evert it's the opposite or sorry rather when we invert it's the opposite so inversion is this way and like we talked about last week with the inversion ankle sprains it's basically that if you think of the way you're most likely to roll your ankle that's inversion and then the opposite direction is eversion so those muscles on the front compartment the anterior compartment they're the ones that dorsiflex or pull the toes up the ones in the back of the leg typically push pull the toes down and then the outside compartment pulls the foot out into eversion and then we have the inverters are in kind of divided between the compartments. Oh so yeah, so that's what that's all about. And I did a weird movement or a weird position, but yeah, you can see a lot of military when they uh, kneel uh, for shooting. Um, mm -hmm. That's what Gian just said. Your knee will go forward instead of bringing your toes up. But yeah, that's, um, that's another position that you can see military uh, use when they, uh, they work out or when they're trained. Um, awesome. So yeah, this is a really quick anatomy. Obviously you can find a lot of, a lot of more details if you want to in the anatomy of uh, the leg, but it guts, it's going to be useful for us to better understand what's happening here during the injury. Um, and also Jan did explain the functional movement of uh, the lower leg, the ankle and the foot. Now, Jan, what is the cause of the MTSS? 
So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the cause and the definition and whatnot. So basically, medial tibial stress syndrome is an exercise-induced syndrome. So it's an overuse syndrome that causes pain along what we call the distal posterior medial border of the tibia. So that's a lot of words, but basically what that means, this is a right leg. So right leg, this is the big toe right here. So basically the lower part of the shin on the inside part of the tibial shaft, that's where people typically have their discomfort. Typically we see issues, and we'll see this on bone scan and what have you, the junction of the top two thirds with the lower one third. That's kind of the sweet spot if people are gonna have problems, is that junction between the top two thirds, lower, lower one third along the inside part of that tibial shaft. Um, oftentimes people will have pain on palpation, which is a fancy word for poking around, over the length of about five centimeters. So pain, the painful area will, will uh, be over that type of uh, a distance. So um, this occurs typically as a re result of excessive tensile forces, which are applied to the fascia or soft tissue um, by the action of the musculotendinous unit. So we have soft tissue that attaches the muscles that are in those compartments that Francis was telling you about to the tibia. So the muscles that are commonly implicated in, the, in this are your soleus and your posterior, or, yeah, posterior tibial area, tibialis posterior as well as flexor digitorum longus. So muscles in those compartments, they attach via fascia onto the, um, onto the, uh, the bone. And then that fascia, when it's pulled on repeatedly, it can become quite tender and sore. Um, so the condition usually, like I said, starts out as a fasciitis. So basically anytime there is an itis, that means inflammation of. So if you have a tonsillitis, you have inflammation of your tonsils. If you have a gastritis, you have inflammation of, of your gastric tissues. So a fasciitis, obviously inflammation of the fascia. So that's, that's the early stage of, of, a, um, of an MTSS is the fasciitis. That will progress if it's not managed and the activity isn't modified to a periostitis. And what the periosteum is, is the outer surface of the bone. And it's very, very nerve rich. So when it becomes inflamed, it's very, very uncomfortable for people. So we start with a fasciitis, soft tissue issue. We move to a periostitis, so the bone is starting to be affected. Ultimately, we end up with changes in the mineral density of the, of the bone in that affected region, which I showed you on the, um, on the skeleton there. So this last phase, when the, the mineral density of the bone is affected, that really increases our risk of stress factor. And that's the worst case scenario with this problem, is that it can develop into a stress factor if it's not managed properly. So basically, medial tibial stress syndrome, it is multifactorial. It is an overuse syndrome. Some of the factors that can contribute to this are our anatomical structure. So people who are over pronators can get themselves into trouble. People who have really rigid high arch feet, they can also be prone. So if your feet either are too flat or too high, those are both risk factors for this problem. We also sometimes see folks who have what we call tibial varum. And you'll notice their tibias, their, their shin bones, they're very flared. They, they're, they're not straight up and down as we would expect. Their tibias kind of come out like so. And that can predispose those folks to problems as well. So that, that can be very tricky to manage because some of these anatomical problems, you're born with them. And they're not something that you can come into the clinic and we can necessarily fix. But we have to learn how to modify what you're doing to make it safe within the confines of your personal alignment. So talked about anatomical structure. Um, our training programs can also be contributing, um, which we're going to talk about in quite a bit of detail later on. Flexibility can be a contributor. Um, if you're, for instance, if your calf muscles are really tight, that's going to affect the way that your foot hits the ground when you run, and that can, can create some issues. Um, muscle strength is another factor that can contribute footwear, as well as the mechanics of your movement and your running. So um, again, we have to look at all of those things because they can all contribute. The changes in any of these vari variables can, can lead to a uh, medial tibial stress-related injury. So what's, <clears throat> what's also interesting is um, the term um, of shin splints. Now, before I show you a picture of that, I just heard my headphones saying that uh, it needs to be charged. So I might change my headphones during the explanation, but uh, just a heads up uh, if I do have a problem with uh, um, the headphones. 
Now, if I do share my screen, because I already uh, put the pictures uh, out, there you go. So the problem with the shin splint is um, the scientific world, when you read um, what is a shin splint, and it's a fun fact, so it's uh, going to help you guys to better understand why we, uh, when, when we use the word shin splint, uh, what's happening. So in the literal, uh, literal world, world, when you read some scientific study or uh, books or whatever, they will always have a different description of what we mean about a shin splint. Now on this picture right here, that's what I did. I just put all the description that we can find in some literal, I have a hard time saying that word, but literature, um, you're gonna find these kind of uh, description. And they're kind of like not really saying all the same thing. So what we are saying is um, if you do uh, say that you have a shin splint, you're not really precise in your information. And also even doctors uh, or the medical staff will not really use the word shin splint because it's not really a diagnosed um, situation. It's more a description, like a general term that say, oh, you have pain in your lower leg area so there's a lot of different kind of pain and uh um in that area but uh, mtss is a proper word is a preferred uh word um, because you know exactly where you have the pain and what is causing the pain so it is preferred to use a term that is, that are more clinical correct clinically correct sorry specific and useful when we are using this so that's why shin splint um, it wouldn't be really a, a, a specific term. And uh, this picture will be sent to you guys a little bit later. But yeah, Gian, how can we know that we have an MTSS? Well, um, despite how common MTSS is, it is a tricky condition to treat because there are, or, or sorry, to, to recognize because there are a number of, of differential diagnoses that can mimic this. So things like anterior compartment syndrome, tendinopathies or tendinitis in the area. We also, when we see someone with this problem, we're also trying to figure out at what stage are they? Are they in the fasciitis stage or have we developed to a periostitis? or are we full-fledged to a stress fracture? And that is going to influence how it's treated. So it is a little bit complex to diagnose. To me, the cardinal thing is, though, I'm just gonna go back to this model here. Again, this being a right leg. Um, I, what I always do is I just start digging around and you usually can come up, 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 and people are fine. And then there's this tender spot right at the junction of that one third, two thirds on the inside. And that's, that's a fairly diagnostic thing, particularly if the history is, you know, an abrupt increase in impact activity or load bearing activity. If, if you have those, that's your history and your symptoms, and you're tender along there, we're, we're pretty confident that that's what's going on. Um, uh, compartment syndrome is another thing that we see quite often with, with our, our members, which again, like like Francis had said, we use the term shin splint just as a general general kind of term. So someone with compartment syndrome might be told they have shin splints as well as someone with medial tibial stress syndrome. So it is a very general term. Um, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about bone physiology. That sounds fun, doesn't it? Um, so... Our bones, much like our muscles actually, respond to repetitive loading by adapting their structure. We have a physiological law called, called Wolf's Law. And what basically Wolf's Law states is that bone has the capacity to adapt its structure in response to imposed loads. So much like muscle does really. Um, so bone will grow and remodel in response to the forces or the demands placed on it. The regular activity promotes bone strength through increased perfusion of nutrients to the bone cells. So for instance, so yeah, you can see, you can see here, um, there, when, uh, when a bone, bone is loaded, there's compression and tension, um, it, kind of depending on whether we're talking about the concave or convex side of the bone. And uh, over time, the bone will respond to that compression and lay down more bone. So um, there was a study done with uh, tennis players where they compared the bone density of their racket holding arm with their free arm. And uh, that, that, that study showed that bone density was as high as 17.6% higher in their racket holding arm than in their, their other arm, which I, I thought was really interesting. And we have actually a picture of some x-rays that were used in that study. I have to do my, my weekly x-ray picture. 
it wouldn't be a podcast like that. So there we go. So yeah, you can see on the right side of your screen is that individual's right arm, and you can just see the bone density of that side compared to the left. Not only the thickness of the bone, but look at the whiteness, um, how, it, how it's much whiter on the right side than the left. And uh, that's just, again, the, the bone is thicker and bigger, but also the bone is denser on, on that right-hand side. So that is the same individual, right versus left arm. It's pretty, pretty interesting stuff. So yeah, in males, 17.6% difference in tennis players, arm to arm. So interesting stuff. That's a really nice picture. Yeah, I thought it was cool too. So um, in terms of bone remodeling, we have cells called osteoblasts that lay down new bone. And then there are cells called, uh, called osteoclasts, which absorb bone. So the, the blasts are the givers and the clasts are the takers. And I think we have a picture too, just to show that bone and that bone balance. Do we? So um, osteoclasts, so they're the bone absorbers. They are usually absorbing bone that is diseased or worn out. So the old bone is taken away and new bone is laid on top of that. So if the osteoblasts, the builders, are more active than the clasts, there will be a net increase in bone mass, which is what we want when we train. If the reverse happens, so the osteoclasts are more active, the bone will degrade and it will become kind of kind of um, yeah, less dense. So here's a video actually I thought was really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Francis found it, and it shows how the osteoclasts and osteoblasts work. Yeah, also how like how she was explaining, like you can see the interior of the bone right now. But yeah, I'll let Gian explain what she just explained with the video. We're not going to watch all the video, but here you go. So those are osteoclastic cells, and you can see how they're taking bone away. Um, good thing I said that right since it was captioned. And here are <laughs> osteoblasts, which are laying down new bone as they move. So it's it's pretty interesting. So the yeah, bones regenerate. That's what it says, actually. It's like the bone regenerates all the time because yeah, all our cells sure. in our body will die at one point and we need to regenerate all of, all of it. So that's mm -hmm. the job of these two uh, things. They're just saying right now that the osteoclast, how they get rid of the bone is uh, an acidic environment. It's pretty much acidic in there and that's the way you can get rid of it. It's exactly the same thing as you put an egg inside of vinegar. You will not see the shell after 24 hours, pretty much the same thing. So where we run into problems with stress fractures, particularly particularly tibial stress fractures, which are the most common lower extremity stress fracture that we encounter, um, is when there is an imbalance between the osteoclastic activity and the osteoblastic activity. So progressive loading, as we said, builds bone density. But what happens when we impose our body to new loads is first the osteoclasts remove the old bone. And then the goal is we're going to get rid of the old and lay down stronger, better new bone. However, the osteoblasts are active in our rest period. So if people are overtraining and they're not adequately resting, the osteoblasts never have a chance to do their job. So you train, the osteoclasts activate. But if you don't get a, get a break, it's more osteoclast, osteoclast, and eventually the bone will pretty much disintegrate itself because the osteoblasts and osteoclasts are not um, balanced in their activity. So if the bone erodes more quickly than it can be replaced, it weakens and stress fractures can result. And this is why progressive training and cross-training are such important concepts instead of, you know, the whole weekend warrior syndrome where we just go nuts and uh, don't give the bone a chance to rebuild and repair itself. So what are the, uh, the treatments? Okay, well, I'd like to emphasize with this condition, like we talked about, it's very multifactorial in terms of its development. So I would really... Um, advise against a cookie cutter approach in terms of management. So um, initially, um, like with most things, we're going to manage this conservatively and try to, to manage the inflammation. So to get that itis portion, whether it's a fasciitis or a periostitis under control. 
So we do that with, you know, the, the rice concepts, um, ice, there's definitely a rule for anti-inflammatory uh, medications in some cases, rest, certainly activity modification is very, very important for these individuals. The priority is really to catch this in the early stages to prevent progression to a stress fracture. You can take your recovery time from two weeks to six months pretty easily by not stopping when you need to. So as we said before, this is very multifactorial and we have to assess specifically to determine which factors need to be addressed for each patient. So if there's an anatomical structure that's, that's problematic, such as an overpronation, we might need to put a person in insoles. If there is, um, again, if they have a very cavus or rigid st structure, we might have to put them in a more cushioned type of shoe. Um, so I'm just giving you some examples there. If there's an inflexibility, we're going to have to do stretch that out, maybe do some manual therapy and hands-on work to release certain muscle groups. Um, we definitely pursue strengthening for sure for people. And there is some research that shows that individuals with less lean muscle mass in their lower bodies are at higher risk of stress fracture and MTSS. We also, in some folks, need to look at uh, footwear, and we also need to look at running mechanics. So again, um, for me, I noticed that this is my shin splint protocol for people, because again, we have to figure out, number one, what is the cause of the shin splint? And number two, if it is MTSS, what are the factors that have contributed to that? And that's where we need to approach it. And the factors that, uh, you know, maybe have given Francis issues with his shins may be very different than mine. Um, so that what we talked about before, Wolf's Law, about bone responding to um, mechanical stress. And so we definitely try to apply that physiological principle to our programs for people. So a well-rounded well physio and rehab program can help ensure that you get back to your normal lifestyle quickly and safely. Um, so there is strong evidence that exercise increases bone mineral density, both strength training, so high muscle load activity like weightlifting, as well as weight-bearing endurance or aerobic exercise like running, cross-country skiing, um, those can both uh, um, result in positive effects on bone density. So those are things that we definitely look at when we design a program for somebody. There's definitely a role for taping. I've had pretty good success with taping for this problem. I mean, obviously, if you are having a stress fracture and you tape it, that doesn't mean that you're safe to go and run a marathon, just to confirm, but it can be effective in terms of symptom management. Um, some folks, like I said, are are requiring orthotics. We sometimes will dry needle if there are some muscles that are, are really hypertonic and, and contributing to that fasciitis problem. And uh, yeah, again, I just would never approach these people with this is the program, we all do the same thing. So yeah. So Francis, uh, we talked about treatment. What would you say would be some, some good rec reconditioning recommendations? Do you want to show the taping first or do you want to go with the reconditioning? Let's see how we're doing for time with the taping. All right. We'll do your reconditioning first. So as um, Gian just explained, uh, what's really good is there's a lot of studies about, um, let me uh, share the screen again, because I, I want to show you guys the studies that I'm talking about. Um, so uh, Kino Quebec is a, a Quebec um, governmental uh, committee like scientific committee that do publish some um, oh I thought I've opened it yeah they do publish some uh, documentation obviously it's in French so for all the French people if you want to read that book is very good um, what you can hear uh, read on the on the on the title right here it's uh, physical activity and the health of bone um, and they are recommending a lot of good stuff for people who are uh, physically active and uh, starting at the age zero to uh, the age 99 or, you know, that expression, what it means. So it says, uh, basically, the sooner you start uh, doing some impact activity, the better it will be. Um, there is a graphic that I like to show to show you how important it is. Um, the graphic right here that you guys can see, it's still in French. I'm sorry about the French version, but um, I'll explain to you what it means. So on the uh, Y uh, line here, it's going to be the bone density. And on the axis, it's going to be your uh, the age. So you can see zero to when you get old. Um, and you can see the big difference between uh, boys and girls and physically active boys and sedentary boys, physically active girls and physically active, uh, sedentary active girls. 
as you can see, between the age of eight-ish to the end of your teenagers, so 17, 18 year old, um, you will see that there is a really big peak of bone density during that period of time. And you can also see that uh, the red line is way higher if you're um, uh, during that period of time. So that means if you're physically active during that time, you will have a bigger bone density. And what's really nice about that is the longer, if you do it during that time, it's going to stay high, really high during the, the rest of your life. Because, you know, after the age of 35-ish, um, your bone density will go more in regression than progression. So you will have to continue, try to continue keeping your bone density really high um, during that period of time. But you can see that if you are physically active during that period of time, you will be uh, in a good position for the rest of your life. So it's really recommended if you do have a family with kids and uh, you uh, you want them to do some physical activity, it is really recommended to do a lot of impact activity. So a type of uh, impact physical activity would be uh, skipping, uh, running, um, some sports like that, even like, uh, like Jan said, playing tennis, any kind of impact that you're gonna have on your bone it will create a micro fracture in your bones. Like if I can say it like that to better understand it, and then your bone will repair it and try to uh, put it thicker or having a bigger density. So it's going to get stronger. So that's the way you can see it um, of uh, how your body reacts and works on that. So this is one of the study. There's another study right here that is uh, actually uh, saying, um, and it's going to be uh, for you to download if you want to read it. Um, it, it's saying um, the good thing about what I just said right now, um, the sooner you start jumping, the better. And you can even like uh, prevent osteoporosis if you do that kind of uh, uh, lifestyle when you're young. Now, what I want to show also, I just don't want to get mixed in my stuff. It's going to be here. This is a reconditioning program that they do recommend for people who do have MTSS. Now, the first thing to do, as Jian already mentioned, is you need to rest <clears throat> and you need to put some ice to reduce the inflammation. And as uh, the first phase, you can consider yourself in the phase one during that time. Um, it's going to be a duration of three to ten days. So initially, <clears throat> that's what you want to do. And then you do have two type of group. You have the group one, which is people who are a little bit fitter. So for example, if you do have a person who runs marathons, do Ironmans, ultra marathons, obviously their reconditioning may not be at the same rate as you guys. And also if they're a younger than 35 year old, because what I've just explained after 35 year old, your bone density try to regress instead of progress. So you might jump into group number two instead of group number one. Um, if you do have the chance to evaluate your VO2 max, which is the volume of oxygen that you have in your bloodstream while you're doing a cardio uh, fitness uh, activity, um, you will be able to uh, to know in which group you're uh, going on there. Now, just a big head up, heads up, uh, if you do have a 45 milliliters per kilogram per minute, this is a really good VO2 max, uh, obviously depending your, on your age. But that, that is just saying if you do have a really good cardio, basically. So if you do have a chance, uh, any kind of a kinesiologist, exercise physiologist can do uh, a test to evaluate your VO2 max. But if you don't have a chance or you didn't, never did it, I would say start in group two. That would be really uh, a, a, safer, a safer uh, way to do your reconditioning. And also it might take more time than what it's recommending right here. All right. So you might take a little bit more time to jump from phase one before going to phase two. What I really like in all the phases is what you can see at the bottom right here. It's the pain-free scale. Uh, so before jumping into any kind of phases, you got to have a pain-free transition. So you got to be able to do what's recommended on that thing before jumping into the next phase. So like I said, it might take more time for you before jumping into phase two. But um, if you don't do that, if you uh, jump into another phase when you're not ready, 
it might um, it might not help you at all. You might feel that uh, you're regressing and not progressing in your reconditioning. So very quickly, you'll see what you see in phase two right now. This is more uh, in uh, longer weeks. So in phase two, you're going to be doing a lot of physical activity. Um, and you can see what it's uh, saying right now. You do some cross training, um, a 20, 25, 30. So during that week and jogging time, it's zero minute during that time. And you're going to uh, progressively increase the jogging time from uh, one to three to five minutes. And that's the progression that you're going to do during that time. Um, the cross training is other uh, type of fitness. You have all the details on the top right here. And this is the same thing as I mentioned. Uh, you got group one, sorry, and you got group two. Group two, they have a little bit more uh, loading volume in their training because, as I already mentioned, they are a little bit fitter. Um, at the bottom, you can see that it says if you're capable of running a uh, jogging, sorry, a 10 minute pain free, you are ready for phase three. Now, phase three, that's the phase three. Um, and phase three is just a little bit before what you were doing before. So uh, you're going to do that program. It's going to last uh, around four to five weeks, but it might take a little bit longer before uh, you go back to your gradual uh, increase. Also, there's the rule. Um, there is a rule that does exist. The rule is the 10% rule. So the 10% rule is um, basically if you're running a 5K, uh, you don't want to where are you guys? Uh, you don't want to uh, increase the next week more than 10% of your of the distance that you did. So if you're running a 5K, you're pain-free, the progression will be, okay, I'm going to do a 5.5K because that's going to be five 10% more than your 5K. Now you do your 5.5K, you're pain-free after that. Guess what? You can increase again by 10%. So this is a good progression to go back to where you were running before and you don't want to increase uh, too fast because if you're increasing too fast, the pain may come back. And if it does come back, you'll go back to square one or you're going to have to redo everything again. So the other thing is uh, what I would say um, also during the 10%, I don't know if I'm forgetting something or I wanted to say something and I just, it just went away. Um, Oh, it's um, what I see also, it's just before you go back to your normal sports, uh, like with that kind of injury, it might happen when uh, you're, for example, uh, running inside during the winter and you're running on the treadmill and then out of a sudden it's so beautiful and, and nice outside. You're going to go on the track and then you're going to go run on the asphalt. So the surface that you're running on, it might also provoke the, the MTSS. Uh, so it's just to know like Jan said, it's a syndrome. When we say that you have an injury and it says a syndrome, syndrome, it's multifactorial. It says like it's not one thing that we know exactly what it is and we can just fix that thing and then boom, you're out. It might be multifactorial. So there's some, a lot of stuff that creates the pain and we have to evaluate everything in your in your uh, uh, physical activity lifestyle or even your training and all that to prevent or stop that from happening. So when you do have pain in your shin splint, if you do have that kind of pain or MTSS, it's always good to talk with us, um, the health professional, that we can evaluate all the factors that can create that pain and also uh, fix it. Now, uh, the exercise physiologist here will always probably evaluate your biomechanics uh, the running skills that you have, also the intensity of your workout. Sometimes people want to do a marathon and they're like, oh no, that uh, competition is in two weeks. I, I need to get ready for it. And then in two weeks, they're going to have a uh, too much volume in their training and that, that's going to create the MTSS. So it's always good to have a professional with you to evaluate your lifestyle, your training, your mechanics in uh, your running or even in your sports itself and also uh, your uh, gear. Um, and the, the shoes, we don't really want to talk about that because uh, it's going to come back later. Eh? Um, me and Jan will uh, do a podcast exactly on shoes. So don't miss it. Uh, don't miss that podcast. We'll, uh, we'll talk more in details with shoes because if we start that, it's going to be a two-hour podcast for sure. 
Um, yeah, I don't know if I did forget something, Jan, but do you have anything to add on that? I think there's a question for you in the chat. Oh, yeah. So the VO2 Max uh, on these watch that we're having right now, um, they are, I would say, they're pretty accurate um, uh, for, for evaluating if your VO2 Max is good enough or not. When you're running outside, there are some factors that we do um, evaluate for um, for your your uh, for for calculating your VO2 max. Now, a real VO2 max is maximum. Like max is like when you get your maximum effort, and then we can evaluate your volume of oxygen in your bloodstream. Now, the best way you probably saw it is when you see people with a tube that goes in their mouth, and it's usually done on the treadmill. And uh, they're gonna run as fast as they can. The, the 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 actually what we do during that time is we want to fully exhaust that person, and then we're gonna have a metabolic cart, which is gonna evaluate the amount of oxygen that goes in your in, in your in your mouth, and then the the amount of uh, CO two that comes out, and then you're gonna see a bunch of numbers on the computer that's gonna tell you exactly, precisely. What is a VO2 max? Now, these metabolic carts, sadly, they're really expensive. Um, they uh, You don't really see that often. It's going to be probably at hospitals or high performance uh, department that you're going to see these kind of stuff. Um, but uh, when you do some tests, like uh, the test I do at the gym is the Bruce protocol that I use, but there's the Astern protocol. There's like a bunch of uh, protocols that you can follow to, to evaluate your VO2 max. Now these VO2 max are, I would say, um, I, I have the word in English. It's like not submaximal, but it's a prediction. So they're going to tell you, okay, according to your tests, what you did that day, uh, it's going to be at that level. And it's a plus minus, like a range of error, a plus minus 3.5% uh, 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Each protocol will tell you like a zone that's going to be your VO2 max was around that area during that test. So um, the Garmin's are pretty good also. They give you a good VO2 max uh, level. Um, obviously, your VO2 max, it depends on your mood, how you feel that day and all that. So obviously, um, the more you do tests like that, the more precise it's going to get. And the more training you do, the more your VO2 max will also um, get better. So that was a really, really long answer i'm sorry about that but i think it's um it's clear i'm like if, if i'm not clear just uh yeah rectify the question or whatever but yeah that these uh, these garmin watch are getting better and better with time for sure like garmin fitbit um what, what, what's the other one uh polar polar watches are pretty good too um i'm um, typing Oh, yeah, 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 like uh, Carmen, that's really a good question that you're asking right now. Um, type of exercise, any exercise. So I did mention a couple of exercise in the past um, uh, podcast. Running is not something that is uh, easy to do. Uh, it's one of the first thing that we do in our lives, though. Um, as a baby, as a young kid, you'll see people starting running, but it doesn't mean that you know how to walk fast, um, that you know how to run. So basically, and it's a sport, you know, it's an Olympic sport by itself. So that means it depends on the, the distance that you're going to run. So if you do long distance running or if you do short distance running, for example, sprints, 100 meters, 200 meters, or just a little bit more than that, not too much. Uh, these uh, running technique will be different than if you are um, running a longer distance. So yes, there's a lot of stuff that we can do while uh, we are working out now. I did mention like skip A, skip B's. There's a lot of skipping uh, exercises that you can do. You want to do even skip C's. Um, now, if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, um, I would Google Google it. So just Google YouTube uh, skips, running drills. Um, these are the stuff that you can do. It's pretty easy. You go out a running track and you do these exercises. You want to perform your technique um and on your running and then that's gonna that's gonna uh, help you to prevent all the pressure now don't forget the mtss what's happening right now is the impact that goes on your bone all the time that will create um in um, uh, a load of that uh, it will create the pain so if your running is more 
fluent and there is less impact and the absorption is is done with your joints and your technique uh, you will have less impact in these bones and you will be less likely uh, creating that mtss uh, injury so again i do give a lot of uh, uh long answers but also Jian give you a couple of answers in your um uh in your uh in, in the chat so yeah so these are the stuff that you could do to prevent or to increase your technique into running and decrease the chance of having that kind of pain one of the things that i would recommend also is you got to be patient when you do have that kind of injury people wants to get back to sports as soon as possible um i would say we can compare that with concussions um concussions even if you feel bad uh, better you you are okay. You cannot really go back to your physical fitness level or what you were doing before as fast as you think. So people don't want to wait that long, but it, I would say it's better if you take more time to prevent that from happening again. Um, you could see it. I know I'm just uh, giving a similar example, but there's a really popular example of uh, injuries that uh, professional athletes are taking more time than you think. Uh, before kind of going back to play, for example, Sidney Crosby with his concussions, um, he did took a long time of rest before going back to the NHL. And as today, we're not even talking about uh, uh, symptoms or, or uh, problems with his concussions anymore. So these type of injuries are taking more time to heal. And we need to be patient and we need to always go progressive with our uh reconditioning part so we have to be patient that's my uh that's one of my best uh, advice i can give you today well i mean you know if, if you're two weeks into a program and you're starting to have problems and we can modify it and have you back in action in six weeks we're a lot further ahead than someone who has symptoms at two weeks pushes through and in six weeks they've got stress fractures and they end up immobilized and we're not even allowed to start reconditioning them for three months so sometimes like People don't want to quit, and I mean, I certainly respect that, but this is one of those conditions that should not be pushed through beyond what is, is reasonable. Or again, the consequences can be pretty, pretty dire. I've seen some, I've seen some pretty bad, pretty bad prolonged recoveries come out of, out of stress fractures that probably could have been managed quite simply in their early stages. Yes. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so um, okay, I'm having an echo on um, all right, so yeah, that's pretty much. Um, oh yeah, one thing I could have um, uh, finished with, I wrote it down. I just not to forget, um, going uphill and downhill and mountains. Like obviously here in Wainwright, uh, if you find a hill, let me know because I'm really interested to find one. But uh, if you go in other provinces um, uh, or even like more on the west coast of Alberta, um, you'll see a lot of people who love to run in mountains or even uphill and downhill so this is uh one thing that you could um probably go progressively because this might create some pain into your mtss so the arena reconditioning i would say start with flat surface and then progressively re uh reintroduce your your body to what you were doing before so if you're like a heel a hiking uh, guy uh, or a person um it's always like don't get back to your normal fitness uh, just go back uh, progressively, and uh, that's going to be a permanent change after that. Another thing that I have had uh, people have issues with is just remembering that the road has a camber. And so when you run in this way, and then you come back on the other side of the road, your right leg, for instance, is always going to be on the down slope. So sometimes on the road, you're better to run in and back on the same side, so, um, so that you basically your legs get to get a chance to kind of balance out and give you some symmetry. That yeah. can be an issue too. Yeah. I've seen with some people. It's simple, but it's something that people don't necessarily think of because it is a very subtle issue. So there is also the gym uh, in Wainwright. Um, the gym floor it's 110 uh, meters uh, round, and when you do running, 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 always inside here, you're gonna feel some pain that's creating on your knee, left knee, if you're always running on the same side. Um, so it's even better if you're running on a longer distance, like a 200 meter 
track or 400 meter track. And also if you're always running on the left side, your body will always get used to the left side, but not to the right side. So it's always good to variate. Um, and actually variation, it would be one of the rule of physical activity lifestyle. You got to variate your physical activity. As you can see, Gian showed you a picture of an X-ray of a person um, that uh, is always playing tennis. And you can see there's a bone density difference on the same person. That's like her left arm and the uh, the right arm is more dense than the left arm. Well, that happens in a lot of like mono sports players, people who are playing only one sports. You can see a specialized development, I would say, for the muscle, for the flexibility, for the bones, but you will not have a fully developed. So that's why these people, even if they're doing a lot of sports, we will recommend them to go at the gym and um, focus on the, on the muscles that are not really... Uh, demanding during the sports, you know, they're going to like just focus on their weakness instead of just doing always the same thing. Now on the lifestyle habit, I would say if you do have a lot of activities that you like, the more variation you have in your life, the less, um, I would say specialized development on your body you will have. So you will have more a complete uh, development on your body. So that's why even the CSEP recommendation, they were saying that you need to do not only cardio, but muscles, but flexibility uh, in your week time, just to create a balance in your development. So that would be something. Now people in the chat are just telling me where's the mountains and in our regions, thank you. <laughs> um, I'll uh, keep, uh, keep track of these mountains and uh, I'll go run on in these mountains. Um, yeah, so we're lucky to have people in the chat to, uh, to comment my stuff. Um, all right, so we don't have a lot of more time left. We only have three, three minutes left on that podcast. So I hope you guys did enjoy uh, that podcast today. Next week, oh, I forgot to uh, send you guys the, uh, um, the prescription uh, that you can follow with these kind of injuries. Next week, we're gonna have our Ironman uh, athlete, which is the warrant uh, officer, uh, Frédéric Nalin, who's in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. Um, but um, if you guys want to uh, uh, come at that podcast, I'm really going to appreciate because it's a special guest. He's going to be uh, here to answer your questions. So if you want to start uh, Ironman or triathlons or you just want to start uh, bicycling or just uh, running, He's going to be your guy to answer all your questions. So don't miss it the next week. And me and Gian, we will talk about rhabdomyolysis, um, a really scientific world, but the word, but you'll see what we're talking about that. It's a really uh, relevant uh, topic for that kind of sports. So it's going to be here on Demio. Uh, if you can register as soon as possible, that's going to be awesome. And we will try to have some French people from Quebec also. So it might be a bilingual podcast. But that's totally fine. Um, and I hope you guys are going to be there. I hope you guys did enjoy this podcast this week. And uh, Gian, any last words? No. No, we're all good. So. so Just any suggestions for topics, let us know. Oh, yeah, for sure. We will uh, obviously accept any kind of topic. So you just shoot us an email. And we will be more than happy to send you guys an email about that. So see you guys next next week. Uh, at same time, same place. Uh, don't forget to register, and we'll see you guys then. Thank you. Bye.